Now we also need to think about grades as they affect people's self-concept, right? Um, how you give the grades determine what people take away. I want you to think about how people emotionally react to grades, how your students will emotionally react, right? You can think that students who get good grades will always feel good about themselves, and students who get bad grades tend to not feel good about themselves. And in general, that's true, but it depends on a couple other factors. Um, one is that, as we stated before, if you give grades as a form of a judgment, and if you say things like you're so smart and you're such a good student and things like that, those are internal traits that are largely static or unchangeable, right? And you want to focus on the things that are changeable and in the control of the students. Um, if you give them as information and emphasize that this is just an estimation of where you are right now, right? It's not perfect, um, but it's where I think you are. Here's some ways that if you want to get better, you can, and I can help you do that. Um, but you don't have to, right? That's up to you, whether or not you want to grow. Saying things like that takes some of the pressure off and allows the students to develop a more growth mindset that the thing that's value, one, is growth, and two, it's in their control, right? Strategies and efforts are things that students can actually control and if you emphasize that as you give out your grades and your feedback and so on and identify that, you know, there are tons of issues with grades. They're shorthand for a bunch of stuff. But if you have good assessments, you, you, you're you using them as your best guess to where people are at, right? That takes some of that negative emotion away for the students who aren't doing well. But it also benefits the students who are doing well, right? Because if you praise students in a way that provides a judgment of them as being very smart or being very good, they tend to shy away from challenges in which they might not be smart or might not be good. Or if they do fail, they don't have any strategies to cope from because it undermines their whole self-identity. And this is what's called the learned helplessness response. I'll post an article on it. You can read it if you want. Maybe I'll toss it up as an extra credit thing. Um, Sure, why not? Three extra credit points. Just thought of, thought of it right now. Um, and you can read it. It's called Caution, Praise Can Be Dangerous. It's some of Carol Jwex, who is the person behind the whole growth mindset thing. Um, some of her early work, way back from 99, talking about how praise can actually damage students by leading them to this helpless response. So both praise and criticism needs to be focused on effort and strategies, right? Give students an ability and a reason to focus on their ability to learn and the time they spend learning rather than just raw ability. Because some kids find it easy, some kids will be challenged, but you can't do anything about that, right? So make sure that you focus on those things that they have some control over. Finally, you also want to get your students in the habit of assessing, or assessing themselves, making sure that they're starting to judge and make judgments about whether or not they get things and what they can do about it. We also talk about grades as guiding pursuits because we tend to focus on what we're good at. What we get good grades in tends to be those careers that we end up doing. Uh, it's hard uh, to think of a case where somebody really enjoys something that they keep failing at, right? If they never succeed or everyone else around them is doing better than them, it doesn't usually end up creating a bunch of positive feelings. And so the grades you give, and, and really they're just a reflection of the student's mastery and, and effort and ability, uh, they will guide pursuits. You also have, right, if you get really good grades in math class, you get put in the advanced math group. If you are really good at soccer, you get put on a select team. Right. And so all these ways that we grade people, give them different opportunities and guide students towards spending more time uh, on some things than others. A great uh, example of this is that when uh, you look at professional hockey players, and this was study was done a long time ago, and I don't know if it still holds today. 
but it used to be that most hockey players are actually just a disproportionate number were born in the beginning of the year in a lot of January, February, March birthdays. And the story behind it was that that was the year cut off for when you could uh, enter. And so um, you have, or I shouldn't say that's the, the cutoff, but the kids who were born in January, February were older, almost a year older than the kids who were born in November and December, right? And so when you think about, uh, you know, a 10-year-old team, our team of 11-year-olds, the best kids are probably going to be the older kids. And so they're going to get extra training. They're going to get more leadership opportunities. They're going to be put in positions of power, right? They'll get chosen to the select teams. And it just keeps going where the rich get richer. And so that's the same kind of thing that goes here, right? If you keep failing at something, you're not going to get those extra opportunities and so on. Um, what you want to do is make sure that you are always enticing kids to come forward, meaning that even when performance doesn't meet the standard, this is the importance of focusing on the negative as well as the positive or the weaknesses, Right. Tell them something that they did well. And it's not going to always be easy, but find something and then give them a path forward. So it's important that you are realizing that you are guiding their pursuits. And so you want them to not feel threatened by negative feedback. You want them to use it as information to get better. Um, when we think about grades then, right, and we think about how we should use them, well, the first thing you need to do, and this is really Popham's chapter that I'm not really going to have uh, you read because it's summarized right here. One, identify what your standards are. And this is something, again, that you have a ton of control over. Second, determine what evidence counts and how much it counts, right? Tests typically cause or, uh, count more than assignments because assignments can be done with friends, parents can help, and so on. Tests or more formal assessments like that tend to tell you what the student can do by themselves, right? And so usually that counts a little bit more. But it's going to be up to you to decide how much things count. And I just want you to think through it to come up with the best estimate of where that student is at that point. Finally, convey them openly and honestly to let people know what they know and what they do not know. I don't want you to ever feel bad about giving somebody a bad grade. And you will. It's a natural reaction, and I still feel it. But the idea is, right, that it's important for them to get that information. The Santa Claus bias that we talked about last week or the week before um, is what this is really all about, that it does harm the students. Because if you tell students that they're good when they're not, right, you're setting them up for failure. If you tell them, they are lacking in some areas, but you tell them that, right, that is just where you are, and you can learn anything if you want to spend the time doing it. So the question is, do you want to spend the time doing it? And I can help you do that, right? And you want to, as you're doing this, right, make sure that you consider all these other validity, reliability, and bias issues that are coming up when you're talking about your grades, especially to parents. You should be able to defend your grading system to parents. That's something I'm going to ask you to do. Now, there are some other things that we think about when we think about grades and things that you might be tempted to put in, right? Well, should improvement be considered in my grades? And I'm going to say not really and not usually. If the grade is supposed to reflect whether or not they meet standards, it shouldn't matter if they could have done it before they even got to your class or they can't do it, right? Otherwise, then you have a kid who started at a first grade reading level, got up to a third grade reading level, right? You're teaching fifth grade, and they're still nowhere near the standard, but they grew two grades in one year. That's great. Then you have another kid who is at a sixth grade reading level and stays at a sixth grade reading level. Now, they have clearly met and exceeded standards, but they didn't grow much, if at all, right? There's no way that the student who is at a third grade level should get a grade higher than the student who is above grade level. There's no way that should happen. So improvement can't really be considered when you're talking about content mastery grades. The same thing for effort. 
if right you can do things without trying that hard and you do them really well and perfectly your grade should reflect that you meet or exceed the standard and somebody who tries really hard to read but still can't read should not be told that they can read if you try really hard to solve algebra problems but you still can't do it i shouldn't tell you you can right same things with attitude, same things with where they start, same things with whether or not they're cooperative. These are all constructs, right, that we're really not trying to measure. This is a construct validity thing. And so while you can keep track of these, and things like effort and attitude and cooperation and growth are all things that we will care about, they get a separate report card. And a lot of schools have separate report cards for things like this. So finally, I'm going to want you to read the Alfie Cohen article from Degrading to Degrading. He thinks grades, like everything, punishment, rewards of any kind, um, homework of any kind, self-regulation programs or character building programs, he thinks that they're all bad. Uh, and he's made his career out of talking about how everything's bad. Um, so he claims within this article that one grades ruin interest, challenge, and the quality of thought in students. So students, if you grade them, everything else is exactly the same. If you grade them, they become less interested. They do not want a challenging test. They'd rather go the easy road. And they think less deeply. And he's, he makes some good arguments for this stuff. But I want you to think about it carefully based on what we've talked about so far. Two, grades destroy the teacher-student relationships because the teacher becomes a police officer and always punishing people, right? Um, that too, I will want you to think carefully about, about whether or not you agree with it. He also claims that grades are not valid, reliable, or unbiased. And we've talked about this. Yeah, there, there are problems with these things, but... There are a whole bunch of things we can do about them. So it's up to you to decide whether or not these things are true. Um, finally, grades encourage cheating and grades waste a lot of time that distort the curriculum. He says other things too. Um, I want you to let me know if you think he's right or not. And I have a little assignment uh, that will be posted later on in the week uh, that I will want you to try to address some of these issues in. All right, if you have any questions, let me know. But that is it.